we are coming to our final panelist, and that's uh, Ambassador Bekim Sadiu, Ambassador of um, uh, Kosovo. Uh, he was born in 1974. Mr. Sadiu obtained a law degree from the University of Pristina in uh, 1999. 2001, he obtained a master's degree of democracy and human rights from the University of Bologna and University of Sarajevo. In 2005, Mr. Sidi obtained a master's degree of international relations from the Bilkat University in Ankara, Turkey. Currently, he is doing a PhD at that same university in international relations. Mr. Sidi worked as assistant professor at the Department of International Law of the Law Faculty of the University of Pristina from 2002 to 2008. Um, on April 2008, Mr. Sio has been appointed as a principal political advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Kosovo. To, from 2009 to 2012, Mr. Sidiu served as ambassador, uh, extraordinary and plen plenipotentiary of the Republic of Kosovo to Turkey. And from June to 29, 2012, Mr. Sidiu serves as a consul general of the Republic of Kosovo. Kosovo, we should say, isn't it? In, in, New, in New York, USA. So Mr. Sedu is also married, uh, and he's got three daughters, three, three kids, three children? Three yeah. Two daughters and a son. Two daughters and a son, okay. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Koen um, Ladies and gentlemen, dear, fr dear friends, uh, dear Mr. Kilic, Mr. Akan, dear colleagues, it's a special pleasure to be here, of course, uh, among uh, such an aus uh, outstanding audience. Um, I would like, at the beginning, to, a, um, to emphasize that the Peace Island Institute deserves a particular credit, I think, for organizing this debate on the Balkans, uh, this series of the debates, actually, uh, here in New York at this point in time. Because as we experienced, uh, especially us uh, diplomats, but I am pretty sure a lot of you share this experience, Balkans is slowly slipping from the international political agenda, or at least, let's say, from the top of the international political agenda, and it's becoming more and more a regional, which means basically an EU, uh, EU issue or EU and NATO issue. And this is, I think, mostly for good. And this has been emphasized also by, the, by, by my colleagues. Uh, uh, because this means that the, our region has come from a long way, from the time of, of, uh, of wars, uh, genocides, ethnic cleansing, uh, to the time when the, the major issue in the political agenda is meeting the standards uh, for, for the EU membership uh, process. So the impression is that the term Balkanization, which has been depicted uh, very well by my colleague and friend Goce, uh, and which uh, basically uh, denotes a process of violent disintegration along ethnic lines, has left the space to the term Europeanization. Or let's say Balkanization through debalkanization to the Europeanization were a concept which, which in, our, in our lenses, in our perspective, uh, means a, um, the process of integration through embracing and preserving the standards of, I mean, the integration to the European Union, of course, uh, standards of democracy and, and market economy. So during the last, let's say, decade, basically, uh, in our region, the major point of reference for measuring the progress um, towards the a successful political and socio-economic uh, transformation, if you want, have become the progress reports that the EU Commission issues every, every October for, uh, for, a, um, uh, for, for all countries. Uh, so the changes are huge. Uh, but the points of departure, I would say, for all countries all, all of our region are not the same. Uh, we all have undergone or are passing through a transition, but not the same one or equivalent one. Uh, I refer here mostly to the countries from the Balkans which have once lived under communism, which are covered by this, uh, by, by this uh, panel. Uh, the common ground of transformation for all countries in our region uh, is a transition from a monist political system to a pluralist democracy and from state controlled to a market-based economy. So this is the con common de denominator for, uh, for transition for all our countries. But beyond this, uh, some countries have gone through additional layers of transition, uh, namely from post-conflict or post-war, from a war to post-war societies and from pre-independent to independent political status. Uh, countries which uh, once were part of the, the communist Yugoslavia uh, fall into this group. Uh, the Republic of Kosovo falls, falls into this group too. So uh, 
we had to pass or we are passing through three uh, fold transition, uh, which means first from communism to democracy, second from war torn to a post war society, and third from pre independent to independent political status. As, as we all know, the Republic of Kosovo is the youngest among the seven independent countries which have been created uh, at the ashes of the, what was once called communist Yugoslavia. Uh, so basically, Kosovo has been created as a state uh, as at the process of, or as a result of dissolution of one state, not secession uh, from any country, as sometimes uh, the, the, there is a wrong impression on, on, on this, and it's a crucial, a, a crucial uh, difference. Uh, as we all know, uh, our journey of freedom of and independence was a, was difficult and painful, actually. But where do we stand today? Actually, just as a coincidence that the, uh, not part of conspiracy because I served in Turkey, but uh, we just uh, celebrated, uh, uh, we just celebrated the six years of our, sixth anniversary of our independence just last week. So the timing of the panel is coincidental. Uh, during these six, six years as independent state, Kosovo has demonstrated vision, capacity, and commitment to embrace and enhance the standards of democracy, multi-ethnicity, human rights, and market economy. Uh, with, with our policy of uh, very good neighborly relations and with our strong, loyal, uh, Euro-Atlantic inclination, Kosovo has become a pillar of peace and stability in our region. Uh, with 106 UN member states recognizing our independence uh, up to this point, and with, a, uh, with the others expected to, to join soon. Uh, we are also taking our place in the family of the independent and sovereign nations. So this is in brief where Kosovo stands today. Uh, where do we want to go? This is more important. As an old saying goes, people cannot work for the future that they cannot imagine. Uh, I will try to, to briefly summarize our vision and approach to the process of the Europeanization uh, uh, of, of, of Kosovo and of uh, our region. Uh, the Euro-Atlantic integration for Kosovo is a national, uh, paramount, I would say, national aspiration. Uh, and, and accordingly, it's the major foreign policy uh, objective if, of, of our country. And in our perspective, uh, this entails uh, primarily uh, membership into two organizations, uh, into NATO and the European Union. So, uh, although as we all know, NATO, sorry, NATO and the EU are uh, two independent regional organizations, for us, they represent uh, two pillars of the same Euro-Atlantic um, umbrella. Uh, I shall emphasize at the outset that um, Kosovo is in the initial stage of a uh, formal relations with the European Union. In October 2013, uh, we have started the negotiations for the stabilization and association uh, agreement, and we expect this process to be completed within the first half of this year. Uh, this marks basically the commencement of the contractual relation between the Republic of Kosovo and the European Union, because as, uh, as we all know, uh, the EU launches the stabilization and association agreement, uh, process and agreements only with the independent countries. Uh, we have also in 2012 launched a visa liberalization process and we hope that this will be completed also without a, a further delay. Uh, we have also something which is called structured dialogue on the rule of law with the, with the European Union. And finally, in 2008, the European Union has launched a, uh, which is, I mean, a mission which is the biggest uh, uh, EU uh, mission on the rule of law uh, called ULEX and it has been actually done after following an informal invitation from, uh, from, from uh, our country and also a decision from the uh, European Council. Now, why Balkans need Euro-Atlantic vision? It has been explained very well by, by, uh, by the previous speakers. Uh, I will mention four general reasons why I think the process of integration in the EU and Euro-Atlantic structures for Kosovo and our region is, I think, indispensable. First, Geographically and social culturally, we are part of Europe. Uh, despite the fact that, as we all know, uh, we have had a non linear geopolitical, let's say, and, and, and social cultural trajectory in our history as compared to the history of Central and Eastern Europe and, and, and Western Europe, of course. But still, the European Union is the common political and socio economic house of the European nations. And as a member of that family, we should not be left out. So, this is the first basic reason why I think the uh, 
Euro-Atlantic vision is uh, without alternative for, for Kosovo and for our region. Second, uh, Euro-Atlantic umbrella is the strongest, uh, strongest guarantor of peace and stability in our, in our region. Uh, perhaps we have defeated the, uh, the evils of the past, uh, but I think too much triumphalism would be, would be a bit premature. Uh, evils of the past have not disappeared entirely from our region. Uh, we still notice the presence of uh, uh, political tendencies which, uh, which are based sometimes on ethnic uh, exclusion and nationalism. Uh, we still, pre uh, we still uh, see in some parts of our region uh, tendencies to solve ethnic differences based on territory-based approach as opposed to citizens-based uh, based approach. Uh, most obviously we see this uh, tendencies in, in, in northern Kosovo and, and in some parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, at this point, it is important to underline that the vision of the Republic of Kosovo is based on inclusiveness, interethnic existence, and harmony, which are the core European parameters uh, to manage so social cultural heterogeneity. We have, we have adopted an incom incomparably high standards advan or advanced standards for the uh, protection of ethnic minorities particularly for the Serb minority in Kosovo, and we are happy to see that this has progressively led to the steady integration of the Kosovo Serbs into the public life of the Republic of Kosovo. The holding of the local elections uh, last November, for those who follow the developments there, was just an indication of the successful, or of the products of this, uh, of this policy of, of uh, inclusiveness uh, along the ethnic lines. Uh, on the other hand, in 2012, as it has been mentioned, uh, we have started a dialogue with Serbia with the facilitation of the European Union uh, to normalize neighborly relations. Uh, we cannot change many things. Obviously, one of the things which we cannot change is history. Uh, as we all know, as we all might recall, uh, Kosovo, the people of Kosovo have suffered a lot under occupation and oppression for many years and decades. Yet there is another thing we cannot change too, and that, uh, that is geography. So we cannot change the fact that Kosovo and Serbia will be there as the neighboring countries forever. And having in mind this, and also inspired by the European idea, uh, Kosovo has started the dialogue with the Republic of Serbia in 2011 with the facilitation of the European Union. So the European Union is again uh, a framework, an indis indispensable framework for, uh, for normalization of relations uh, between our two countries. Uh, we are committed to this process. Uh, this process has produced uh, a lot of results and has been much more, let's say, productive than many would have just uh, thought uh, two or three years ago. And we hope that the other side will move along the same, uh, same line, so uh, demonstrating commitment and determination uh, in this process. But uh, what I wanted to, under to underline is uh, my second argument why the EU is without alternative. So. Uh, the Euro-Atlantic umbrella is indispensable not only for social, social and economic prosperity, as it is commonly uh, assumed, but also for peace and stability in our region. It is the strongest received, uh, the strongest received against the evils of the past, uh, which, has, uh, which, which have uh, caused a lot of, of pain and suffering in our region. Uh, having said that, I don't want in any way to depict a pessimistic picture about our region because that would be a um, that would be an incorrect incorrect depiction actually that would not reflect uh, the truth because uh, uh, I think the political situation in our region is better than any time in in many decades in terms of the peace stability and, and regional cooperation as it has been uh, underlined by by the other speakers uh, before me but uh, as uh, a famous uh, Theoretician international relations, all the waiver once famously said, the other for Europe is its past. Uh, once we firmly reach that point in our region, when the other for us is not our neighbor but our past, then we can be a bit more maybe uh, relieved or comforted. Uh, the third reason why the, the EU is indispensable uh, has been also mentioned is its transformative power. <coughs> uh, as it has been said, meeting the EU standards for the aspirant countries requires significant political and, and economic transfer, uh, reforms, which improve the government, good governance, uh, advance the democratic standards, uh, human rights, 
uh, the, the, the economic well-being and so on. So by making these necessary reforms, the countries of our region basically serve better to their citizens while making these reforms which are a requirement for the EU membership process. And this is the third, re the third reason why I think the EU membership uh, process is without alternative. And the fourth reason has to do with the globalized world we, are, we live in, which Mr. Uh, Aras has, uh, uh, has mentioned in the beginning in the opening speech. So we live, uh, I mean, deepening of integration and increasing interdependence at the very multi, let's say, layered levels uh, is the defining feature of the globalized world we live in. So as a small countries with limited demographic and economic capacities, uh, integration into bigger markets and, and bigger social political structures is a sine qua non condition. Uh, EU represents a global actor which uh, is assuming also increasingly pro uh, an active political role. So it's becoming also increasingly an important global political actor. And, and having said that, uh, the EU represents for us, for the countries, for the small countries in our region, a strong platform for catching up successfully with the global trends, be they economic or technological or, or the other. Uh, now, how successful the EU enlargement towards the Western Balkans will be, it's a different story, of course. Uh, again, this issue has been addressed. Uh, this will ultimately depend from the political will and social economic capacities of our societies, but also it will depend from the political and economic developments within the EU. Uh, we have to do our homework, uh, which are not easy. And the list of homework starts with a good neighborhood policy. Uh, governments in our region should take the lead, as they are doing, and I think they are doing this uh, successfully uh, in, this, in this endeavor. Uh, the former stability pact, which is now called the Regional Cooperation Council, to which Kosovo became member last year, uh, is one of the important instruments through which the EU and Balkans interact with, with each other. Uh, the Stability Pact uh, has been launched uh, with initiative of the EU in 1999, and that marked the, the month when the war in Kosovo ended, basically. And in 2008, uh, this has been transformed into something which is called Regional Cooperation Council. And again, 2008 is, is the year when Kosovo uh, gained its independence, so it's interesting coincidence again. Uh, but apart from the RCC, there are other regional mechanisms, uh, such as the Southeast Economic Cooperation Process, uh, which, uh, I mean, create the necessary framework for the, uh, or which for, for the cooperation in the region, which is uh, the, the backbone, let's say, of the European integration process. So, we have to go to EU by making our region truly a European. Uh, this is uh, one way ticket for us, and this is to the benefit of everybody. So I will stop here and we'll welcome your questions and comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Bekim.